Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Time's flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgebeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome. With so much turmoil and uncertainty in the world, it's easy to lose sight of the things that make life meaningful. The smile of a loved one, the laughter of children, the wonder of the natural world, and the kindnesses and interactions that connect us to one another. But despite everything that's going on around us, we have so much to be grateful for. Not the least being that there are people in the world like today's guest, award-winning filmmaker Louis Schwartzberg, who've made it their mission to remind us of the beauty in humanity, the resilience of the human spirit, the value and benefits of community connection and compassion, and the vital role that the simple act of gratitude plays in our lives, our health, and the well-being of our world. Renowned for his breathtaking imagery, magical immersion, visual healing, and profound time-lapse cinematography that have made such gloriously vivid movies like Fantastic Funga, one of my favorites, Wings of Life, and the 3D IMAX movie, Mysteries of the Unseen World, so successful. Louis Schwartzberg joins me today to discuss his latest and perhaps most heartfelt film, Gratitude Revealed. Louis, welcome. Hi, Sandy. What a gift and a pleasure to be here with you. Ah, oh, what a wonderful movie. I've watched it three times now and I'm just riveted. Stunning, stunning imagery. So Gratitude Revealed, it started its life as a, a short, a little uh, TED talk, talk and yep. TEDx talk, in fact. And then it grew into this movie. So tell us, what was the inspiration behind the first film and how it came to grow into a feature film? Yeah. Well, when I heard Brother David's, uh, you know, talk about gratitude, this poem that he had, he had written, I thought I could illustrate it and be able to make it something that would engage young people, actually. Um, I have two, at that time, I had two uh, college-age daughters. And if anyone has college-age daughters, you know how they roll their eyes every time you want to give them advice. And they say, Dad, you're so cheesy. And I wanted to see if I could really, you know, create something that wouldn't be perceived as being new agey <clears throat> and so <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> so that was sort of the the impetus to, to to experiment and when i created it and i had it be part of a ted talk lo and behold what i discovered it went viral and so many young people had commented that they use it as a um a video alarm clock to align themselves every day that they turned it into a practice and so I knew there was something there. And then um, that was back, I think, in 2014. Um, and then I, after all these years, I've been like capturing these magic moments with remarkable but ordinary people, let's say not celebrities. And I've been saving these nuggets. And during COVID, when I really could, couldn't go out and shoot, I thought this was the ultimate time to put the movie together. And so in combination with experts, thought leaders, luminaries like Deepak Chopra, Brother David, Michael Beckwith, Jack Kornfield, I mean, the obvious people that are, you know, inspirational thought leaders. I also had a lot of just ordinary people, the salt of the earth, children, you know. And um, I edited for almost a year and a half, putting together the thousands of hours that I'd been filming into one giant umbrella under, under that umbrella of gratitude touching on things like creativity curiosity connection love wonder um forgiveness you know these are i think the values that add up to gratitude and um, i wanted to give people just an immersive journey also sandy i think coming out of the pandemic a couple of things occurred first of all most of us 
have suffered from this idea of disconnection. You know, we what we took for granted, like having dinner with your friends and family. Um, this political discourse has gotten really bad. And so it's only understandable that a lot of people feel a lot of despair and a lot of hopelessness out there. Um, the, the environmental crisis looms over our, our heads, especially I think for young people. So it is understandable that people are, you know, depressed and everyone's talking about this mental health crisis that might be looming around the corner. And sometimes the universe, you know, um, uh, decides when things need to be born, you know, and Sometimes. with gratitude revealed, it just turned out, I think, because of those three big factors, that it was the perfect moment. And it's not the cure for dis for despair or depression, but I think it's a baby step in the right direction. Like, you can always be grateful for something, you know, that my fingers move, that I'm alive, that I'm breathing. I mean... And, and you can't have a, both a positive and a negative thought in your head at the same time. So to get yourself out of that negative spiral of rumination of what's wrong and, and being depressed, at least take a pause and be find something you can be grateful for. And mm. I think that, again, I, I thank the universe for like uh, creating the perfect timing for something to emerge. So when you were interviewing all of these people over a period, and then, of course, it all comes together to create this amazing movie, you, um, you spoke to some very interesting people. I mean, apart from all the luminaries that you mentioned, you spoke to people, women who, or you interviewed women who had, you know, come out of prison and right. were looking at how they were going to change their lives, children, all kinds of people. Who was there one person or one moment that left a lasting impact with you? Mm. Well, there were a lot. I think the women in the halfway house, I found that to be extraordinary inspirational because that was a, a sequence based on creativity, you know? So who would think that you could talk about creativity with a program where at this halfway house, they were teaching these women stand-up comedy as a way to build self-esteem. So that was super duper powerful. The other one that really had a big impact on me was the woman in Appalachia, the rug weaver. And there I am in, in you know, Kentucky, you know, which is a quote unquote red state, I guess. But, um, you know, here's this like wise earth mama, you know, at this giant loom and the wisdom that she shared as she was like weaving this rug was so deep and so profound that it it really rocked my soul. And the way she connected it to her husband plowing the fields. Um, yes. Yeah, it, that was really, really interesting. It did get my attention too. And, and it was like it was like ultimate poetry. I mean, you, you couldn't write anything more elegant than that. And again, it's just coming from, you know, quote, unquote, they're not ordinary, they're extraordinary people just aren't famous. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And of course, she ended that by saying that what he, you know, what he does every day, nobody tells him to do. It is just commitment. And, you know, commitment is another one of those words like courage and trust that I think we've lost. We've lost our connection to a lot of those values over yes. the years. Yeah. 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 So it's, I it's, think really, it's really. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the movie, well, Jack Hornfield, he, he, he equates trust with patience, you know? When he talks about patience, he really talks about trust, trust in life. Brother David, same thing, trust in life. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that opened up a whole other perspective for me as well. You know, the trust is just like having the ability to let go and believe that what unfolds is what is meant to unfold and that it, there's a lesson in everything that happens, good or bad. Do you think that, you know, what you do, you have to have a lot of patience to do what you do, and you have to have trust that you're going to get the results you want. Do you think that making this um, film has changed that in any way or enhanced your trust in life? Absolutely. I think that, um, well, to be quite honest, I just had a recent, 
you know, medical scare where, you know, they found some of my arteries were blocked and, you know, you have to, you think about, wow, this could be, uh, you know, scary according to the doctors. Thank God I got it, caught it in time and, and I fixed it. But that just really made me double down on gratitude and the gift of life um, and trusting in life. And so I'm sure you hear this all the time from like people that are like cancer survivors or, or people that have gone through a real big obstacle. But those challenges are a gift, yeah. you know, and, and you hear all of these people usually say that they're more alive than they've ever been. Um, they're, uh, they're celebrating life to the, to the max. And uh, I was surprised that I could even feel a much deeper, deeper connection to, to gratitude than I already had. Wasn't it Jack Cornfield in the movie that talked about um, Buddhism and how the Buddhists at the monastery where he trained would pray to have challenges in their life? <laughs> And I loved his line. He goes, but you don't have to pray. It will come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Difficulties yeah. are going to come. We all have bumps in the road. And, you know, there is scientific studies that have showed that people who practice gratitude, for example, are more resilient. Yes. And resilience is really an important aspect of <clears throat> happiness, survival. Um, bad things happen to all of us. Big things, little things. Somebody could, like, scratch your car. And for some people, that might be two days of depression. And for some people, they may go, no big deal. You know, <clears throat> it's not going to, they're not going to allow that incident to uh, slow them down. Right. Yeah. And, and, and again, they get mentally depressed, physiologically sick over something because it's all going to happen. And there are a lot of things that are out of our control. So um, being resilient is a gift and a practice that we all need to really work on. Yeah, yeah. And the neuroscience also shows that gratitude and generosity, um, the two come together, that actually it, people are healthier uh, and it increases longevity. Yes. So, yeah, good reasons to practice both. Yeah. yeah. And, and the people, again, who journal a little bit, you know, with, with gratitude, uh, the studies at UCSD in um, cardiology department that I think Dr. Dean Ornish was involved with, they, people with heart disease uh, uh, became healthier just by journaling what yes. they're grateful for. Yeah. And it's a loop too. It's a very beneficial loop because once yeah. you start practicing gratitude and generosity, the brain becomes more altruistic. Yeah. altruistically inclined as well so yeah it's a gift that keeps on giving yeah so you're known for your uh pioneering work with time lapse photography how and why did you start using this technique well <clears throat> thank you for asking I, I think a couple of things first of all i started you know in photography fine art photography and fine art photography i was always in love with you know, the masters like Ansel Adams and Edward Weston, who shot, you know, big negatives and, and large format. And so I've always wanted to shoot 35 millimeter movie film back when I was in film school. But the only people who were shooting 35 millimeter movie film were commercials and feature films. It, it's very expensive. It's very uh, difficult to rent a camera that shoots 35 millimeter movie film. Even back then, it's $100 a minute for film develop and processing. And that's back in 1972. So one of the ways I could sort of get around it and also include my love of photography was to shoot time-lapse. And in time-lapse, what you're doing is you're shooting one frame at a time on movie film, and then you wait. And with flowers, you might wait 10 minutes. With a cloud, it might be 10 seconds. And what it means is you're not shooting much film. So therefore, I'm saving on money because it could take me a month to shoot a four minute roll of film. But the primary reason was a sense of wonder. When I saw the results of what I was filming, because it really hadn't been done before from an artistic point of view, time lapse had been used in scientific studies where they put like a grid behind the plant and they would measure the growth 
to prove that plants grow or move to the light, kind of obvious. But it's great to be able to showcase that. But nobody added, nobody did it from a point of view of beauty, you know. And um, when I saw, you know, shafts of light and canyons and clouds metamorphosize and flowers open and close, it it's a God God's eye point of view. And it takes you out of your limited perspective, that arrogant point of view of the human perception, and realize that, you know, whether it's slow motion with hummingbirds or time lapse with a flower, every living being has its own point of view, its own metabolic rate, and it all needs to be cherished, celebrated, and protected. And it's all different, and that's beautiful. And so to actually see it, I think, is more powerful than to talk about it, you know, and because we're so arrogant that our view is the only view. Even culturally, we're arrogant. You know, like if you live in America, do you think this is what life is like? Well, it's different in India, maybe different in China, right? So just to be able to be in your backyard and realize that there are hundreds of different points of view on life, and how life works, and and what are the the the, um, the building blocks of life? You know, symbiosis, teamwork, connection, nurturing, regeneration, rebirth. These processes go on. We are part of that as well. We are it, but to mm -hmm. see it in plants and to see it in animals it opens your heart. We could never see it any other way. You know, yeah. if you hadn't done this, we would never be able to see, you know, the life cycle of a flower. Yeah. It just would be impossible. I think they're using a lot of this in some of uh, David Attenborough's latest, um, you know, Planet Earth uh, movies. And I remember watching one recently and just riveted because, again, they used so much mm -hmm. of this type of photography. Was any of that footage yours? Well, it, sometimes it gets licensed, but I think I've... I'm proud to say that I inspired, I think, a lot of people to do time lapse in a very high end, high production way. You know, I did visual effects for Hollywood movies, I directed commercials. So I took that same quality technology approach, which then BBC and others have also employed, like helicopters with gyro stabilized mounts, so there's no jiggle. It looks like you're on a tripod and you can fly over mm -hmm. giant landscapes. All of those were tools used for high-end production, major feature films and commercials. And I applied it to nature, you know? And so I've been shooting 35 millimeter films since 1972 and um, have almost 2000 hours of material that um, is sort of my visual visual library. Did you have any idea that it would lead to this kind of success? Um, I think, I, look, I, I believed that, I've always believed I want to turn people on. The problem back then is we're gatekeepers and there's certain models that really you know didn't allow it. If you recall, there were, it used to be like three or four TV channels and then there was cable. And, and now they're streaming. So finally now, like with my own channel to, that I'm about to launch uh, on 420 called the Louis Channel, I've skipped all the gatekeepers. And I can go direct to the consumer with the kind of visual healing content, inspirational content, because most television shows or movies are based on fear and anxiety. You know, that's the model for, they think, keeping people's interest and engagement, and they call that entertainment, you know, is to make you sit on the edge of your seat. What we're learning is sitting on the edge of your seat in fear and anxiety builds up cortisol in your body, right? And I think eventually people are going to go, you know, just like with smoking and with fast food, there'll be a giant, just, you know, clear um, revelation that this stuff is really bad for you and it can shorten your life and it can make you sick. You just, you can't be watching thousands of murders and, and, and not feel that it's going to have a negative effect on you. Um, so, 
know, what I'm trying to do is create an alternative. And, and I think that what most, look, it's not for maybe everybody, but it's for the people that are part of your community. They would rather, I think, be inspired by nature's wonders, which is medicine. It's pure medicine, I believe. And it's better than listening to stories of revenge or violence or cheating or anxiety, conflict. You know, they believe you can't tell the story without conflict. What is the real story of, of nature, especially the feminine side of nature? It's all about cooperation and networking and nurturing and love and regeneration. Billions and billions of little interactions called pollination, called fungi, called, you know, microorganisms that are doing miraculous billions. It's actually right now in your body. Billions of interactions are occurring yeah. at this moment. And that's not a story that they think is interesting. The story they show is kill or be killed predator versus prey, the macho story, even BBC, Nat Geo. I mean, yeah. Shark Week is still the number one popular week on Discovery because they're pressing it, they're, they're pressing that easy button, which is fear, you know, the, the, the primal fight or flight button. It's easy to get that reaction. If I point a gun at you, I'm going to get a reaction, but that doesn't take much talent, right? To make you laugh make you cry, to make you feel, mm -hmm. that takes more talent, but to just like, you know, point the knife at you doesn't take a lot of skill, in my opinion. So, um, yeah, that's what, uh, that's what we're trying to do. And I think we're, we need a new story. And I'm glad that I've been saving all these magic moments, weaving them together. And whether it's gratitude, a journey into the soul, or fantastic fungi, a journey into nature's intelligence under the ground to learn about, you know, um, a shared economy where nutrients are shared without greed for ecosystems to flourish. Those are the models that are literally under our feet, yeah. blueprints for how to live in harmony where everybody benefits for life to thrive. It's right there. I can see so many uses for your footage I mean, you could be playing this in hospital rooms. Yeah. You could be watching them while they're lying in their bed. You could be playing them on planes. You could, you know, I would love to have the the owl. I would love to have that as a screensaver, you know, and just have that every time I open my computer. Because then everything that you're doing after that, you're doing from a different place. You know, you're doing, you've already had that thing that makes you feel calmer and brings a smile to your face. Yeah. And gives you a bit of wonder and awe. We are, we are bringing it into healthcare, and we have some clinical trials going on at UCSD. We're in every room. I saw they had a brand new hospital, and they had like smart TVs. And there's a new movement in healthcare called patient experience, where um, they care about what's going on with the patient. It's about time, but they have an iPad that tracks your medical records so you can be aware of the procedures and treatments that are going on and control the lighting and the shades in the room and also control the TV. And so I came up with a suggestion. I go, let's ask the patient where in the world they want to go to be healed. Where's their power spot? And then the choices are ocean, desert, forest, flowers. And it's a half hour video with music, no words. So you can go on your own personal journey you can process whatever you need to process. Everyone should be on the, in their own sense of wonder, you know. And um, yeah, the results I think are positive in terms of reducing anxiety, blood pressure, res respiration rate, better sleep, less addiction to painkillers, um, shorter hospital stays. I mean, that's what and we really, want. And and probably better recovery rates. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, if we can't put people out into nature, we can certainly bring nature. healing energy. In. And especially, as you pointed out, Sandy, I'm not showing you, like, what it looks like to be walking in the woods. I'm showing you things that the human eye can't see. Mm -hmm. So it's even more special, whether it's, you know, mushrooms growing in the forest or aerials or giant, you know, mountains. Um, it enables you to get a different point of view, which will encourage you to take that walk in the park, 
because when you see the bee land on the flower, you're going to have a deeper understanding of what that represents. It's a food supply for you. It keeps you alive. It is, you know, a mutually enabling relationship that is done without greed and, and, and done to, you know, uh, give us the fruits, nuts, berries, all the healthy food we need to eat. Don't run away from that bee landing on the flower. It's nothing to be scared of. It's something you should be so grateful for. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to play this segment out with a short clip from Gratitude Revealed. Great. Um, and it's a, a clip that gives us a little bit more insight into you. Um, we'll be back with more from Louis Schwartzberg after this break. Okay. I love making tea with lemon. Reminds me of my mom and dad. They were both Holocaust survivors. My mom actually survived six years in Auschwitz, which is pretty remarkable. They came to America journeying across the Atlantic where I was conceived and born in Brooklyn. And growing up in their home, I learned a lot about gratitude. They appreciated all the little things in life, the blessings that came their way. Most of all, the miracle of being able to have children. I've spent the last 40 years filming. I'm always looking for people who've overcome adversity, yet still have a lot of hope, optimism, and resilience in their lives. Those are the stories I love to tell. I grew up during the war years in Austria. That was a time when we were very poor. In fact, there were days when we thought we'd starve to death. And when you have very little, you are very grateful for what little you do have. You think this is just another day in your life? It's not just another day. It's the one day that is given to you today. Om Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Ohm Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Ohm Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, host of Ohm Times flagship radio show, What is Going Ohm? And as an author, editor, and 13 times book judge, who's read thousands of books and interviewed hundreds of authors, I'm constantly asked, what's really worth reading and what's not? So I created the No BS Spiritual Book Club to help you save time and money by picking the brains of discerning names who have walked this path before you. There's no catch, no fees, and no BS, just an ever-growing library of 10 best spiritual book lists from some of your favorite authors and teachers, plus free book excerpts, audios, and video interviews with people like Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., David G., Lee Harris, Mark Nepo, and more. From well-known classics to hidden gems you've never heard of, it's the only no BS guide to the best spiritual books to enlighten your journey of self-discovery. So why not join the club, get inspired and save money at the nobsspiritualbookclub.com. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. 
It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. Welcome back. Louis Schwartzberg, um, we talked earlier about your interviews and the different values that were covered, you know, the patience, the courage, the wonder and the trust. Wonder and awe are something that seem to be sadly lacking these days. Everything seems so heavy that people forget about the wonder and the awe. But you have a vod uh, vodcast, don't you, on your, um, your channel, your new channel. Tell us a little bit about that vod vodcast. Because you have lots yes. and lots of little pieces on wonder. Thank you. Um, yeah, for me, wonder, we talked about earlier, like why I even do time lapse? So it was because of sense of wonder to see things that the human eye can't see, to make the invisible visible. And for me, that is like the sweet spot of the intersection between art and science. <clears throat> you know, and wonder is what inspires you to explore. And I think from the scientific side, it's to explain, you know, uh, with methods, what reality is and how things work. And then I think the artistic side is more of a inward journey to be able to say what drives us, what, what, what makes us feel the way we feel. Um, and to have that sense of, um, of a blank slate you know, the way a four-year-old does when you're looking at things, to be able to look at something and observe it without judgment. That's being in the moment. It seems to me that seems like the core of every spiritual or meditative practice is to become ultimately present. So if I'm staring at a flower, or I'm staring at a lizard, it's like I'm with it. I am one with it because I am not, you know, trying to name it. I am just trying to be with it. And by doing that, it takes me through portals of time and scale that enables me to go beyond my own limited, you know, parameters of existence. And so I want to share those kind of magic moments that I can film uh, on the Louis channel, which is like louischannel.tv, where people can get these little nuggets of wonder um, not only visuals, but interviews with artists, with thinkers, with thought leaders, with um, inspirational people who are also open-minded and seeking that sense of wonder. And when you finally get there, I think what I really enjoy doing when I interview these people, Sandy, when you finally get to that spot of being in the moment, and there you are, and you're feeling it, the question is, do I really need to explain it? Can I just sort of be, you know, wrapped up in the mystery, you know? Or do I have to keep on like saying, well, what is it? How do I define it? How do I explain it? What's the academic explanation of what I'm feeling? How about maybe, perhaps, we just feel it and we become one with it and perhaps there is no human-centric answer for, you know, going beyond that. You know, there you are, you're you're there. And maybe being there is, is where it is. Children are great reminders of that, especially, you know, infants. When you look at, you know, I remember watching my grandson at about six months old, looking at a tree with such, you know, like never seen anything before. And the next yes. day he would look at it in exactly the same way again. So it was a continuous you know, just absolute awe with what was going on in the world around them. And when you see a child like that, then it takes you to that place as well. Yes. Yeah. And that's where I think, <clears throat> that's where I hope we all want to be. It's what makes us, um, it opens your heart, makes you more compassionate. Yeah. yeah. Makes you kinder. Yeah. Like I can't step on an ant. <laughs> I probably do unknowingly, occasionally, yeah. but if I know that, it's like I have respect for every living being because I've looked at ants close up. I, I look at what they're doing. I don't quite understand it all, but I can tell that they're like 
um, you know, making life go forward. And I don't want to get in the way of that. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me about courage, because that's one of the uh, the values. And uh, in a moment, we're going to play a little clip with um, yeah. uh, uh, Norman, Norman Lear, speaking about courage. What What is courage for you? Mm. I think courage, you know, for me is being able to let go of fear. Um, fear, there's a great line, I think, in the movie, too, with the skateboarders. Fear causes hesitation, and hesitation makes your worst fears come true. Yeah. That's from, like, a, yeah. an extreme sports dude. <laughs> but it's also, like, wisdom that you yeah. would get from, you think, from a sports leader. So um, <clears throat> courage, I think, is to be able to go forward, you know, let go of fear, um, to be able to explore, to be able to overcome resistance. And, and, and those challenges, when you overcome them, whether you succeed or fail, you look back and you go, there are blessings in the skies because I learned something. I succeeded or I failed. Either way, you know, I, I, I challenged myself to do something that might have been out of my comfort zone, but but that builds resilience. Go back, getting back down to the idea of resilience. If you're not pushing the envelope a little bit, that's the key to survival. Well, let's have a look at that clip of Norman Lear and his opening words are just priceless. Yeah. So we'll play that now. What about courage? What does courage mean to you? Courage? Yeah. Well, courage has a lot to do with getting up in the morning. It's hard to be a human being. I have not failed to notice. But the more difficult, the more worthwhile the effort. I'm scared every time I go out there. I mean, I get butterflies when I know it's going to be big. It's scary, but it's exciting. We shot the cliff dancers at Muir Beach. It took courage on both parts, their performance and our ability to haul that crane up that cliff and the rig it so it wouldn't fall on their heads, hanging an 80 pound camera right above them. It definitely takes a lot of courage to overcome fear. Fear can't live in the present. It exists in the past and it exists in the future. But if one is really clear and present, there's no place for fear. There's something about the moment that you lose touch with the earth, you know, the moment that your feet lift off the ground, there's this just this instant feeling of joy and surprise. I don't like standing on a cliff if I'm not anchored in. As soon as I'm anchored in and I understand the system, I'm free. feeling of vertigo, it's not the fear of falling, it's the fear of your deep desire to want to throw yourself into the freedom of the feeling of falling. When you take gravity and you just play with it and you find ways to soften it, to dance on walls, to dance on cliff faces, I decided to dive off the cliff of fear and once that happened, I was able to find the dance. It's amazing. It really is amazing. That, yeah, that, that would take a lot of courage for me to do that. So gratitude, I mean, I'm reminded of the whole process of what you're doing, you know, the, the time it takes for something to unfold and reveal itself in its true beauty. And I see that reflected in the movie itself because it's developed its own life. It's got all of these offshoots now, the yeah. gratitude blog, the journal, the resource guide, the gratitude game, even the parent handbook and educational curriculum. So how did all that come about? Well, we want to spread the gift of gratitude and the fact that um, after we made the movie, you know, we had partnered with you know, the Templeton Foundation, which is helping us get this movement out there. And they help work with the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, where for many years they've been doing all this research on gratitude. And so we created a journal 
that people can use to talk about these different values, what they are, and the practices one can do in order to um, get the benefit of that. And then I thought it really would be good to have one sp specifically for teachers and specifically for parents to be able to have a conversation with children regarding gratitude. Um, because there's so much rich science around it, like that gives everything a bit of more uh, efficacy in a sense, because otherwise I think it's easy for people to dismiss some of the stuff we do as, you know, new agey and crystal and, you know, navel gazing and you know, kind of like writing it off. But when you have hardcore science that, you know, talks about the mental health, the mental health benefits, as well as the physiological benefits, that really helps people, I think, lean into it and go, wow, there is something here. And everybody has self-interest and they want to live a long time. And um, that is, a, I think, a good way to get their attention and to be able to say, this is something that is not only good for you, but guess what? It's easy to do. It isn't like you have to sit and go meditate or go do yoga, which is fine. But you can just always close your eyes or open your eyes and look at something beautiful and just think about what can I be grateful for right now in this moment. Yeah. So in short, you've really turned the movie into a movement. That's what we're trying to do. You know, we did it with Fantastic Fungi. I yeah, have to that, yeah. that it, you know, um, it's become a global movement. Um, the timing of it again was perfect based on the universe giving us the gift of the psychedelic renaissance emerging in the end of 2019. And now we have 60 universities that are doing studies yes. with, you know, psilocybin to treat, you know, um, addiction, uh, cancer, end of life, um, PTSD primarily. Um, and we have a clinical trial we just finished in Santa Monica, combining my imagery with psilocybin to treat alcohol addiction. And the results are super positive so far that the combination of looking at, you know, nature's healing energy in conjunction with psilocybin as they're coming on. And then they have the therapy session with the therapist where they lay down for a couple of hours. All of that is proving to be very, very, very powerful. So I've always felt that, you know, we have healing modalities for every sensory receptor except vision, when vision is the most important sensory receptor we have. 80% of the data we get comes into our eyes. So you got massage for touch, you got aromatherapy for smell, we have music for hearing, we have healthy taste for food. What is there for vision and why not? Why not try to really develop and dial in the healing power of nature? We are nature. It's like looking into a mirror and obviously those rhythms and patterns, I believe can heal you and touch your soul. Yeah. It's amazing what you're doing because you're literally providing us with an antidote to 21st century life, aren't you? Yeah. Well, because look, people are not going to throw away their cell phones at this point. And so it's the content that is toxic, you know, and so how can we use this digital technology, like what we're doing right now in the moment for the greater good? That's what we're doing. Where, where are you right now, Sandy? Where Is am it, I? Yeah. Uh, right now I'm in Las Vegas. Briefly. Okay, cool. Yeah. And I'm in, I'm in LA and we're talking to a global audience. What a miracle, right? Yeah. And that's all based on digital technology. And let's use this technology you know, to, to shift consciousness and make people, you know, love the planet in order to fall in love with it. Mm. Tell me about the gratitude game. Well, we've devised some practices that um, help people, I think, engage in it from different angles. And I think that people like to gamify things. And so we're using just all the different, I think, modalities and, and things that people are interested in to engage people. So there's watching the movie, there's doing the journal, there's the game, there's all the different little practices. 
You know, one of the things I tried to do, Sandy, in the movie, for example, is not preach how to live your life. There is nothing in the film that says do this or do that as a practice. I think young people in general reject the idea of being told what to do. Um, but I want to offer people who want guidance, who want guidelines, who want structure, who want answers. So what can I do? We want to offer people the tools in order to do that. So the movie is to inspire you. It's an immersive journey to just feel it. And then once you feel it and get it, then here are certain practices one can do based on scientific research. And you have gratitude gatherings. Yes, we're going to launch gratitude gatherings with groups like yours. Um, and we're going to have, you know, host these screenings on the louischannel.tv, where what you want to do is really cross-pollinate all these communities and have let people bring their community, have a screening, and have the conversation. We're going to do a bunch of live events as well. And um, But most of them, practically speaking, will be virtual so that we can reach a broader audience. And people can apply to host their own screenings of the movie. Yes, exactly. Yeah, we, we're, we're, we're offering people the platform to make it simple and easy and turnkey to get to watch the movie and then have the space for the conversation. It's very clear from talking to you and looking at some of your work and the website and the movies that you've made that you have clearly this deep reverence and awe for the natural world and a deeply spiritual core. Is that something you've always had, this spiritual I'm not quite sure what the correct word is here, but or is this something that your work with nature has given birth to? I think it definitely has come from my work with nature, looking using you know filmmaking, photography, filmmaking, the same thing. I mean, basically, I'm trying to capture things that touch the deepest part of my soul. So it isn't like getting the grandest vista. It could be cracks in a rock. It could be a close-up of lichen. It could be a fire hydrant. I mean, it could be whatever turns me on. I find that to be my maybe my spiritual practice, in a sense. You know, I've had cameras going nonstop for four decades, four decades in a row shooting flowers, time-lapse flowers in the studio. Um, I'm never going to get bored doing that. Um, I've squeezed 40 years into about 20 hours of film because time is the most precious asset. You know, so as soon as one flower is over, whether I succeed or fail, I set up another flower because I can't let time go by because time is the one thing I can't purchase, right? No matter who you are on this planet, how rich you are, nobody can buy time. It just kind of makes that awareness front and center. And so I definitely feel that observing nature, observing the rhythms and patterns, observing what makes life work, observing how to celebrate life is my spiritual practice. But before that, given my parents' background, being Holocaust survivors, um, that inspired me to want to make the world a better place. So that was always ingrained in me when I went off to UCLA, I was going to be a poli sci history major. I was going to be, I was going to fight for social justice, you know, probably being a lawyer. And, um, but when, you know, the anti-war protests were happening, I picked up a, a camera. I learned how to use a camera, there were no iPhones back then. I documented police brutality, especially against women. And that set me off on a whole other journey where I learned how to, um, you know, do a photo essay, which is a lot easier than writing a paper. And so um, that turned me on to nature and nature became my greatest teacher. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still a baby at the foot of a grandmaster called nature that's taught me everything about lighting, composition, color, texture, you know, art. All of that comes from nature and um, I'm in awe of it. So what's your next film going to be about? That's a good question. I've got a bunch of them that are percolating. Um, 
I may want to do one just purely on wonder because I think that's like the ultimate yes. uh, place to be. Um, again, bringing my scientific friends and my artistic friends into the middle and how we can all work together from that, from two points of view. So, um, yeah, I think for now that would be my primary project. Mm. I would like to see more, um, more about you were saying earlier about the eyes and visual, um, and how we can use that for healing. Yeah. Yeah. And those are studies we have currently going. Another one coming up at UCSF, where I want to dial into. I mean, imagine if, if I said music is healing, but then the question is, what kind of music, right? Is it heavy metal? Is it uh, Tibetan bowls? They're different, right? Mm -hmm. So with visuals, I want to start to do some scientific research, you know, using EEG and fMRI, oh. and say, is there a difference between looking at a flower opening? or flying over a glacier, you know? I think there are differences, and if there are differences, then the next big frontier is, can we be prescriptive? Can I say to you, Sandy, what you need, just like in Ayurvedic medicine, right? They go, oh, you're fire, what you need is water, right? In order to balance yourself out. Who knows where we can go? I mean, the eye is an extension of the brain. The retina is really, you know, they scientists claim, a part of the brain. It's immediately taking light energy, turning it into an electrical impulse that in a millisecond is being, you know, perceived in this gray mass called a brain, you know? That's a miracle. It's instantaneous and it sends, you know, signals to the heart and the heart sends signals to the brain. That whole thing needs to be figured out, you mm. know, so that sure. maybe we can Dial Maybe you want to help figure it out. Yeah, well, I think for me, that's the next frontier. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Louis Schwartzberg, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for this movie. I've watched it three times. Right. I know I'm going to continue watching it again because each time, you know, you take note of something different. Um, and it is just uh, an incredible, an incredible feast for the eyes and for the soul. Oh. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Sandra, for all the great work, work you do and for the OM TV channel and your audience, your community, you know, making the world a better place. That's what it's all about. That's what we're here for. Yeah. So that's it for today. If you want to know more about the movie, you can go to the website gratiturevealed.com where you can find details of how to host a screening. You can get the resource guide. There is so much material there. And do check out Louis Wonder of uh, the We Vodcast at Louis, Louis Channel T, dot TV. I'll get that right, Louis Channel dot TV. Yeah, That's it yeah. for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back with another edition of What Is Going On at the same time next week. Till then, it's goodbye from me and a heartfelt thank you to Louis Schwartzberg. Take care, Sandy. You too, Louis. Yeah. <laughs>